Uh, okay, I think we'll start. Jihu, can we take the, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located in the world. Uh, it's so great to have such a nice turnout for this closing plenary. This conference theme, Sustaining Life Challenges of Multidimensional Crisis, was the theme that, that was to be um, last year when we were supposed to have the conference in Quito. Uh, the same title stays. The only difference is we had more crises that we even imagined when we were supposed to be together the last time. The pandemic showed so many different ways in which we need to think about uh, crises and what we're going to do. We had an exciting few days of discussions about so many issues and the multidimensionality of the various crises. There's the COVID crisis, the economic crisis, the health crisis, the debt crisis, the climate crisis, and the multidimensionality of each of this for every one of them. The COVID pandemic has also exposed so many inequalities around the world. It brought attention to the care economy at many levels, inequality in terms of access to resources, in terms of race, ethnicity, caste, urban, rural, just to name a few. What we have also seen is resilience and resistance. As the outgoing chair, I was asked to organize the closing plenary. And for the conference, I thought, given all that has happened in the last year, what were the issues that gave me hope and excitement? It was the movements doing incredible things around the world. Though in one panel, we can't capture all the feminist resistance happening around the world, we have a great lineup of people to talk about a few. Just to name a few of the resistance. In Chile, people were on the streets starting with the protest of the increases in subway fares that has led to a huge transformation at so many levels. In the US, uh, in 2013, the murder of Trayvon Martin and started the Black Lives Matter movement and a year ago, the murder of George Floyd galvanized a global movement to look at systemic racism and the legacy of settler colonialism. In Lebanon, protests over taxes on gas and the fees for using WhatsApp led to larger issues of government corruption and transformation. In India, the farmers took to the streets to protest the Indian government's attempt to remove guaranteed prices for farmers that have led to many, many more challenges. All of these led by feminist movements around the world. I've provided this very simple intro to the multiplicity of things that have happened in those four countries. And we are so lucky to have people who are part of those movements uh, here to talk to us about what was happening there and the kind of uh, resistance and what kind of feminist futures we want to envision. I'm going to read out the speakers in terms of their uh, when they're going to speak. I'll just read them out and they will start. Uh, Magdalena Sopuveda Carmona is the executive director of global initiatives on ESC rights and was a former um, special rapporteur on extreme poverty at the UN, which is how I got to work with her. Paris Hatcher is the founder and director of Black Feminist Futures, an organization working on Black issues in the United States, uh, Black feminist issues. Um, Lina Abu Habib, the interim director of Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship at the American University in Beirut. And Sagari uh, Ramdas, uh, a member of the Food Sovereignty Alliance in India. So I'm going to hand it over to Magdalena to have her kick us off. Each person will speak for 15 minutes and so that we have time for uh, conversation. Those of you who are not speaking, if you could turn your, uh, if you can mute, that would be great. Thank you very much. Magdalena, are you there? 
Can you hear me now? Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and it's a pleasure actually to talk about the exciting moment that all, all we Chileans are, are living at this moment. So I'm going to start with a brief uh, context about the situation, and then I'm going to move to the feminist resistance. So the feminist movement uh, in Chile is not deception in the sense that they have been behind major uh, expansion and recognitions of rights, uh, and also not only about gender and women's rights, but also about economic, social and cultural rights. And this is also the case uh, that we have seen uh, in, in Chile. Then the, the, sorry, I'm having problems moving this down. Apologies, there we go. Sorry. So uh, what I would like to, to start is putting into context what, uh, what, what is called the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the latest social uh, um, protest that we saw that it started in October 2019. So in October 2019, as Radhika mentioned, the increase in very few cents of, uh, of a dollar of the fare of the metro of the capital Santiago, the biggest city in the country, uh, generate a big and massive protest from around the whole country in which people start um, um, complaining uh, and, and presenting demands about their, their enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights. The 30 pesos was really uh, something that the, the movement really immediately transformed to explain that it wasn't the 30 pesos but it was the 40 years of neoliberal economic policies that have been um, uh, applied in the country since the constitution of the 1980 constitution, the constitution of Pinochet was adopted. This constitution and brands neoliberal policies do not protect economic, social and cultural rights do not, uh, and, and, and provide a very uh, protect, uh, provide, secure the right to protect the right to property and uh, allowed for the privatization of many natural resources that, uh, such as water, that they pass on to the hands of the private sector. The, um, this constitution was adopted during the civic military dictatorship uh, in the 80s under a state of emergency and without any guarantee for, uh, for democratic participation or oversight in the process. Uh, so there is a lack of legitimacy of the constitutions. There have been several constitutional reform, but not very essential reform. So the, the main aspect that enshrined the neoliberal policies in the constitution has been kept during democracy. But the, the, the social unrest that started in October 2019 was, uh, didn't, uh, didn't came out of the blue, didn't come out of the blue. It was really something that we can see that economic, social and cultural rights has been at the core of the citizens' demands for years. So um, we started actually with the students' marches that started in 2006. This is the first period of the Bachelet regime in which secondary students started going out to the streets demanding better right to education, but this translated at the end in demands of a changing of the neoliberal system. Uh, this was very uh, uh, important because these students were those who have, were born in democracy. So they, they were really claiming a change against all the other governments and not only those that were linked to the military regime. Uh, then we also have many uh, 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 movements uh, against uh, the privatization of the social protection system. This protect, uh, protest over pension, this no, no more uh, privatization system. And also there were a lot of movements regarding uh, the protection of the environment. So that uh, Patagonia without dam was really uh, a movement that it was uh, stronger in the south of the country, 
but it was strongly uh, in protection of our environment. So when we go to the second period of uh, Michel Bachelet uh, constitutional uh, presidential period in 2014, 2018, there was already a constitutional process that she started. And the, her, the key demands of the population in several of the uh, consultations that were done during that period, during that constitutional process were, were linked to access to education, health and social protections. These, these were the key demands of the population. So the protection of economic, social and cultural rights, it's really at the core of this movement that uh, trigger the constitutional process that we are living in now. Uh, and this, this is also a rejection of the brands of neoliberalism uh, that the, the Pinochet model had in the constitution. And there is a lot of hope, and this is, this is very important, that uh, the new constitutional process, that this new constitutional making process will put an end to the inequalities and will ensure access to education, healthcare, and social protection. 70% of those who voted in favor of uh, a new constitutional making process uh, express this view. So this movement towards uh, demands for economic, social and cultural rights have been run in parallel to the feminist resistance movement, but of course they're, they're uh, interlinked. So in Chile, the feminist resistance movement started like in many other countries in the, in the 30s with the women's suffrage movement but strongly reappeared at key moments in Chile that were also linked to the first one linked to the constitution, the Divorce Act, but it was uh, only approved in 2004. And why it was linked this to the constitution? It was linked because the constitution put the family as the pillar of society, as in many other constitutions. However, it was interpreted that that family, it was uh, um, uh, a man and a woman marry men and women in which the, their um, marriage could not end that. So that is why it was considered that a divorce was against the constitution. And this changed only in 2004, but it was really related to a constitutional discussion. And then the feminist resistance appeared again in a very strong manner, actually linked to two other events that I have uh, recently mentioned. First, the election, the first election of Michelle Bachelet in 2006 as the first woman, a woman president, and the articulation of movement around ESC rights, in particular, the, the student march uh, in regarding to the right to education. So uh, with this, uh, and what is also very interesting is that this movement, this is student marches, that were composed by, uh, of course, by many uh, girls because they were a secondary student movement. Uh, there was an important event that catalyzed uh, the movement for sexual and reproductive rights. That it was that in 2006, the government of Bachelet offered the, um, a, a policy or proposed a policy to provide uh, uh, antique, um, uh, to provide uh, pills uh, to anti-abortion pills, but also anti-conceptive, uh, anti I, I lost the word in English, sorry, uh, anti-conceptivos, if somebody can help me, please uh, go ahead with the, with the world. Uh, to, to, all the, to all the girls from 14 to 18 without parent consent. And the conservative forces in the country consider again that this was unconstitutional brought the case to the Constitutional Tribunal and they won. So this policy needs to be reverted. And this really catalyzed the movement, these girls that were in the student marches, catalyzed the feminist movement that became very, very strong in the country. And then these two movements, the student movement and the movement for sexual and reproductive rights in a way become completely interlinked. This was a very critical moment in the country. Then we also need to consider that many of these students' leaders 
then ended up, and they are now member of the Congress. They were a very young member of the Congress. So again, this, this kind of the social movements were then uh, translated in political uh, movements that we can see also now. I mean, uh, and if we look at those who have been elected to the Constitutional Assembly, most of which are, uh, most of them are independent, are linked to uh, this, uh, this marches. But this was only the beginning. Uh, since 2008, we have seen a very strong uh, um, feminist resistance with march such as like New Namenos, the Age of Mar uh, Marches, as well as many of you probably are aware of because it was uh, it has it was a great success and, and distributed worldwide worldwide the the movement of the thesis last thesis that is the race for rapist in your path so uh, this the one of the main result of this feminist resistance in the current process has been that it was negotiated we were, they they fought and uh, successfully won the possibility to have constitutional parity uh, in the Constitutional Assembly. So in those who are going to be citizens, that are citizens, sorry, that are going to be writing the Constitution. So half of them, and this is very historic around the world, so half of those who's going, they're going to write the Chilean Constitution are women. Uh, the Constitutional parity, of course, was very debated. And one of the main issues that shows, because uh, it, uh, it was said, or, or, or the myth was that the Chileans will not vote for women. So, uh, but what we could see is that once they were put in the list, uh, the great majority of them were elected. And basically they were elected 11 more women than men. And actually in order to have the constitutional parity, we lost 11 women that were elected. So just to, to show you what, what happened. So what is next? What is, where is, I mean, the, the, this moment is a very exciting moment in Chile. Uh, as I said, is the first time that in democracy, now with a constitutional parity, but also with seats that were uh, allocated to uh, indigenous peoples, uh, we're going to write our new constitution. It's going to be written by citizens that were elected by by the population so the feminist movement that has been behind this what we're expecting and the way in which it has been linked to demands on economic social and cultural rights we really expect a transformation of the social and economic system and we expect really that this idea of life in dignity that has been at the core of the social demands and it, it is translated by citizens as the enjoyment of education, access to quality health care uh, and social pension, it is going and housing, it's going to be translated here. It is also quite evident because it's at the core of the feminist movement that what we expect is that this constitution, we don't know how, but we really expect that this constitution is going to enshrine and it's going to protect a care system because these are one of the key demands of several of the feminist movements that we have seen. So we see, we, we expect, sorry, that care and domestic uh, work will have a recognition that they're going to be visible and better this distribution and recognition is going to, to be included. Uh, we also, uh, as we see from those who have been elected, the women that have been elected to the Constitutional Assembly, there is a great diversity of women coming from uh, uh, different sectors of society and levels of education and, and regions of the country. And this is critical because we, we think that there's going to be an expansion of the gender agenda and they're going to be able to mainstream gender in the enjoyment of rights and as a, as a result of the demands of the population. Uh, there is also a very important component that is the link of the, to the extractivism uh, policies that are also enshrined in the constitution. 
Why? Because the, the, the some, I mean, an important part of this feminist resistance consider, consider the, um, they link the, the unleashed extractivism with the protection of women's body. So what we expect is that we are going to see also uh, a, a more envir environmental friendly constitution. Um, and this is, we also think that the, what is happening now in Chile will have an impact elsewhere. The neoliberal policies started with Chile and we believe that they need to end in Chile uh, very soon. Uh, many other countries from the region and around the world adopted the Chilean neoliberal policies, such as the privatization of the social protection system uh, that it was created in Chile, expanded to 32 countries. Many of them has actually reverted those policies and only 12 countries around the world today have a privatized uh, social protection system. So we expect that the, uh, a reverse in the neoliberal policies in the country will have an impact in, in other country. And we also hope that the experience of Chile in terms of the way in which this process has been handled, and we hope that it's going to end it up with a democratic uh, process that is still many challenges to overcome, it can be uh, an example to, to, to other country. Um, so, this this is it. Uh, I I wanted to finalize here, but I'm I'm open for any other questions or uh, or comments that you you might have. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you so much, Magdalena. Uh, just to start us off on such an inspiring note is great. Uh, Paris, you're next. Do you wanna? Hi there. Yes, I'm ready. You're ready. Thank okay, you great. so much, Magdalena, for that. It was um, so super important, such great context, and um, really allow um, you really set me up for a great um, a great segue. Um, so I'm going to start to share my screen, and we'll get started. So excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk about Black feminist resistance in the U.S. and that Black feminist resistance is fertile. That's how I'll frame this conversation. Um, so um, again, my name is Paris Hatcher. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the founder and director of Black Feminist Future. I'll share a little bit more about that later. And I'm also on the leadership team for the movement for Black Lives. This image, I think, is so super important. Um, this was taken in 2015 during the Ferguson uprising. Um, and as you can see, um, the people of Ferguson were met with brute force by the state, um, tear gas, tanks, national guards, um, unprecedented force. Um, when we were just in righteous rage around the murder of Michael Brown. Um, so we know, um, you know, that whenever we resist, that we are met with um, by intense force and repression by the state. However, we continue to resist. So I want to talk about the movement for Black Lives. And so some people um, will talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, which I would say is a uh, is the the language that most people commonly use to talk about the millions of people who have been thinking about um, that has been brought into their the popular imagination around um, police violence. Um, know the know the tagline, know the slogan, Black Lives Matter. But I'm going to share with y'all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement for Black Lives, but I'm mostly going to focus around the work of my organization, Black Feminist Future. Um, but just to share, the Movement for Black Lives is an ecosystem of 150 Black liberation organizations from around the country, around the US. Uh, one second, I need to pull up my notes. Great. Um, the organizations that are within the ecosystem are varied. They range from grassroots, so small community-based projects, to larger national um, national organizations. 
we work on a variety of issues. So not just one issue, we work on the climate to electoral justice, education reform, abolition of the, P, the police, queer and trans liberation, feminist issues, you name it, there's someone within our ecosystem that is working on that issue. There's a black group working on that issue. Um, and that's really exciting, right? So it's not just groups that are focused solely on racial justice um, or just around black liberation, but it's around the intersections of our lives. We are undergirded by our love of black people and our commitment to black liberation and by these three ideological pillars. One, we use a black queer feminist lens as an approach to our work. And I'll speak a little bit more in detail around what that what that means, but we we know that is very, very important. And what makes us different, this formation different? We are built on the legacy of black activism, resistance, black power. And we also know that issues of patriarchy and misogyny homophobia, transphobia have been fault lines in our work and that we know in order to win, we must use a black queer feminist lens. We are abolitionists. So when we say that we're abolitionists, we, we are talking about in particular how systems of punishment and carcerality um, do not build safety. They do not create safety. They do not um, create strong communities. And actually um, they just, <laughs> They're contrary to that. So that we know that we must build institutions. Um, we need to build um, safer communities. We need to invest in people over prisons um, as a long-term strategy. So we reject notions of using the carceral state to deal with the social ills of the country, of the world. And also thirdly, we are anti-capitalists. So we are, we are absolutely, we know that capitalism is not the system um, that works. In particular, as Black people, we know capitalism was built off of our backs, and we know that it is not a system that Black people can thrive underneath. And we are in debate around what the new financial system must be, but what we know certainly and clearly is that we are anti-capitalist. I wanted to share some of the projects that the Movement for Black Lives is moving. Our shared work moves on a table structure and our tables are populated by different organizational leaders that represent, I mentioned the 150 different organizations. I wanna share, for example, the work of the BREATHE Act that's held by the, elect justice, the electoral justice table. The BREATHE Act is a visionary federal bill that would divest taxpayer dollars um, from brutal and discriminatory, discriminatory policing and invest in new vision and a new vision for public safety that really answers the call to defund the police and allow communities to finally breathe. So we know that the impact of policing in prisons is definitely, I mean, it's directly right from chattel enslavement that our people, Black people have been, um, it has been, um, that system has absolutely um, impacted our lives and that we have not been able to move freely. Um, and so the BREATHE Act is a federal bill that hopes to be doing that. And there's over 40 organizations that are working on the BREATHE, Breathe Act. And also I wanted to share about the work of the Red, Black and Green New Deal. The Red, Black and Green New Deal is an initiative of InfraBL that puts Black liberation at the center of the global climate struggle. Um, I think many of you, many of y'all probably, um, probably know this, right? But oftentimes the face of the environmental and climate struggle is seen as um, white people, right? Or animals, which again, we care about people, we care about animals. However, we know that those who will be most impacted by climate crisis in particular in the US and across the diaspora will be black people and other communities of color and indigenous communities. And so the red, black and green new deal really addresses the impact of climate change and environmental racism on black communities. The RBG new deal proposes immediate action for policymakers, corporations, um, and a variety of everyday people to fortify Black folks. So, you know, I'm based in the U.S. and, you know, we have just seen the storms intensify. We know that it has been 
um, 15 years since Hurricane Katrina, and there are people who have never made it back home to New Orleans, right? So there's 100,000 people who, a majority of them were Black people who were forced to leave their beloved city, right? Were forced to migrate because the city did not rebuild with them in mind. Um, did not want them to come back, right? Policies, all of the things that were in place um, that have never been able to move back. Um, and as the storms intensify, we know um, that Black communities and other communities of color and other marginalized people, in particular women and gender expansive people, will be increasingly impacted by the, the reality of the climate, um, the climate reality. There's also other tables within the movement for Black Lives. One that the organization I work with, Black Feminist Future, we anchor the, the table to abolish patriarchal violence. We have a bold, visionary approach um, that says in the next, you know, really in the next 25 years, we have a plan to, to, to reduce the epidemic of patriarchal violence within Black communities, that we live, um, not, and not just within Black, not only Black folks, but all of us, um, gendered people live in the reality of patriarchal violence being, being the not, um, being the inevitable versus the, the thing that's not going to happen. And so we really want to shift the culture. We want to shift um, we want to shift the culture, the practices, the policies, and the abilities for communities to be able to respond to patriarchal violence, where that women, girls, and gender expansive people are no longer holding, right? Um, we're not only, we're not just surviving, right? We're able to thrive. So I want to share a little bit about the organization that I work with, uh, that I, it brings me so much joy to work with. Our name is Black Feminist Future. We are a movement incubator that amplifies the power and brilliance of Black feminist leaders, organizations, and movements within the United States. And also our work is moving transnationally. We believe that it is vital that we build a 21st century feminist movement that is anchored in Black feminist politics. And I wanna show a little bit more. Oh, I don't think this updated in time. Give me one second, y'all. Hmm. Let me stop sharing so I can refresh this page for a second. Okay, great. Now we're cooking. Oh, well done, present. All righty. Thanks y'all for being patient. So why Black feminisms? I mean, I think for, I don't think I have to make the case for y'all, but I think for many folks, um, they, most folks are more comfortable having conversations around um, race when thinking about systems of oppression or how, um, or we talk about the experiences of how we experience the world, but we know that multiple um, identities are happening at the same time. So for us at Black Feminist Future, we say why Black feminisms because one, as an ideology, Black feminisms allows us to make, which is very important for us, make the invisible visible. And that's gonna be like a really big piece when we talk about what happened last year and what's moving into this year. What was made visible by the ongoing crisis of anti-Blackness, capitalism, and patriarchy. That helps us think of and consider include all Black people, it allows us to rethink issues that are impacting Black people, and it allows us to develop solutions and interventions that address the multiple identities and barriers Black people face. So there's no longer this, we need to just focus on single issues, right? Like our, we live multi-issue lives. Audre Lorde teaches us that. I want to just give you some examples of some incredible Black feminist interventions that I think have just been so important that most folks don't know about. In 20, I would say 18, or uh, 17, Mary Hooks with Southerners on New Ground had this vision um, around freeing Black mamas from prison around Mama's Day. That most, most often folks think about the issues of prisons and policing as an issue um, around Black men, right? But we know that Black women, queer folks, trans folks are also incarcerated as well. And oftentimes are locked up because they're not able to, because poverty, 
right? Because of capitalism, right? Not being able to afford a $100 bail. Um, and so this has been an incredible liberatory process of freeing Black mamas and caretakers and reuniting them with their families. I would encourage you to visit, visit the National Bailout, nationalbailout.org to learn more about them. Another important Black feminist intervention is Say Her Name. When we were thinking about the murder of Black people by the police, it was oftentimes thinking about the murder of Black men and boys, which again, very important. But we also know that Black women, girls, trans women, and gender expansive people were also being murdered by police as well. The Say Her Name hashtag that was really amplified by organizations like BYP100 um, really helped to uplift the reality that there had been over 100 Black women and girls that had been murdered by the state. And um, again, this work has been very, very, very important that we say her name, that we remember that, um, that this is also a gender issue. This is also a feminist issue that we must um, contend with. I want to talk a little bit about the work at Black Feminist Future, in particular around last year. Um, and <laughs> things were wild. And for us, we really wanted to give some context around what was happening in the world, in particular thinking about Black feminisms and the political economy, um, especially with COVID and the violence against Black lives and patriarchal violence. We had incredible Black feminist um, economists, some of them say they're economists, some of them are not, like M. Adams, Barbara Rand, Dr. Barbara Ransby, Rosemary Ndebuzi, and Dr. Jessica Gordon-Nimhard, really dive into what does this talk about recessions, bailouts, and stimulus mean for Black communities? And um, you can find this on our website at blackfeministfuture.org under resources. There is a recording of this um, webinar as well. We also have these graphic notes. We really wanted folks to understand what does this national economy, gross dom domestic pro production, and what does it mean for you? Um, and who is getting bailed out, which corporations, and why aren't we getting bailed out? We, in particular, we were thinking about the informal economy, um, which again, a part of our work is making the invisible, the invisible visible, that the care and informal economy is the work that makes all work happen, right? It makes, it, it's how we live. And um, we learned in COVID that, you know, what got prioritized, um, where resources went, went to big businesses, did not go to, not as many resources went to individuals. Um, and in the face of that, what we learned um, is that organizations like Mama Fund in Atlanta started in 2020 and have redistributed 250K, um, $250,000. So really the, the amplification of mutual aid as the way that Black feminist resistance was able to take root. We took care of each other in the midst of a crisis that is ongoing. And, um, and I'm actually pretty curious, and I'm sure someone's probably doing the research around how much money was actually redistrib redistributed through mutual aid networks through last year, through these coming, coming years. When the government was unable to provide we were able to provide for each other. Even at Black Feminist Future, we were able to um, even move some mutual aid funds. And so, you know, COVID as a virus was not, it was not the issue, it was the way that the government responded, right? So viruses happen, people get sick, but when you prioritize um, corporations, when you, corp when you prioritize profits over people, when you prioritize patents over vaccines, um, it, it means a, a, tr a truly different response. You can also find this interview with Mama Fund around what is mutual aid and building solidarity economies, which is their long-term work around redistributing wealth for the long-term and mutual aid networks as a way that we do that. So this is just some of the slides from the gorgeous um, notes that were taken, but as well the is a recording of this as well. So we really see this mutual aid is connected to our black legacies of resistance, um, you know, taken from the 1700s and black communities being able to resource themselves through social aid and pleasure clubs, you know, through funerals, healthcare. And we really saw that come to life during the COVID crisis. 
in the midst of the COVID crisis at Black Feminist Future, we became very, 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 very interested around the racialized and gendered impact of, of COVID. We also saw the rise of the language of the essential worker, right? So valorized, put on a pedestal, yet no resources going to the essential worker, right? So, you know, we love essential workers, let's clap for them, but yet no resources, right? We, we need resources. Um, so we engaged in a year-long process to really understand the racialized, to better understand and also put out into the world the racialized and gendered impact of COVID. We wanted to know how Black women, girls, femmes, and gender expansive people were organizations and movements were, will recover, right? We know that in order for it to recover, um, for us to all to be able to holistically recover, it will require Black feminist solutions and interventions. So the goals of this project, which you can find at blackwomenareessential.com, was to develop a Black feminist assessment or understanding of the political, social, economic and cultural impact of COVID-19 for Black women, girls, queer and trans people, to also surface some of these interventions and to shift the narrative about Black women and girls and trans people from a focus only on our essential labor, but just to the reality that we as ourselves are essential. No matter if you work or not, you are essential, you are valuable. Our first piece is around these demands. We had these uh, Black Feminist Innovation Lab around COVID-19, where we invited 20, organization, 20 organizational leaders together to start imagining what are some of the solutions that we need to be able to recover holistically. Some of the um, demands are we, we need increased access and funding for abortion by making telemedicine more available and eliminating the Hyde Amendment, which restricts federal funds to be used for abortion. We are in an exciting time right now because for the first time in over 30 years, um, this administration has not included the Hyde Amendment on the federal budget, which means that federal funds for abortion could actually finally be accessed. Um, also, all utilities to be subsidized and also to have internet to be included as a utility in the US. Internet is not considered as a utility, yet when you have folks go home, have education to go home, um, you know, education's happening in homes. It's really based on this idea that there's going to be, you know, internet there for, for children to be able to access it, right? So all utilities to be subsidized, right? if, if free. And also financial relief for Black women involved in informal economies to include but not limited to hair braiding, food repair, sex workers. We know these are folks who, again, the informal economy, right, um, keeps us alive. And something like COVID um, really impacted the informal economy, but also showed our reliance on it as well. Veronica, one, how much time one, more, one more minute. OK, let me go speed time. Also, we put out these postcards and posters around Black women are essential, Black families, Black trans people are essential. We have posters and postcards that folks can order um, to send each other. We have a, we, to really remind folks um, that the essential nature is around who you are, not your labor. Okay. Come on, what's up with my little situation? I only have one minute left, computer. So I want to just conclude by saying that Black feminist resistance is incredibly um, fertile, that the work has taken many shapes. It is alive in many movements from large national um, leading the charge to defund the police and invest in Black communities, as well as to grassroots organizations and around work thinking about the political economy to how we recover from the multiple crises that Black people are facing at this time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paris. Such great work you're doing. Uh, very, very exciting. Uh, I'm now going to go to Lena. It's your floor. Thank you, Radhika, and, and thank you so much for the two speakers before me. They were truly, truly amazing and inspiring. Um, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through a little bit um, what is the context in, in, in Lebanon, 
what brought about the revolution what are the feminist voices in the in the revolutions and then what is what is next and what i want to point out to uh, circling back to our first uh, speaker is that the Lebanese revolu the, the revolution in Lebanon, which started on, on October 17th, 2019, was very much inspired also uh, by what was happening in Chile and by the feminist voices in Chile. And I'll come to that, uh, I'll come to that later. Uh, I forgot to say I'm Lina Abu Habib. I go by she and her, and I'm the interim director of the Asfari Institute. Institute at the American University of Beirut, and also uh, part of a new feminist fund for the region called the Dorea Feminist Fund. And very happy to be with you all. So, um, so the first point, um, looking very quickly at the context, um, and of course, as you as you all know, and as um, uh, Radhika started in her in her. As I make, political volatility. I don't think in my life I've ever gone through a moment of that you can count on. Lebanon is an integral part of it and instability has been part of its uh, history. And over the last even more than a, than a decade, it is a country that is uh, a country and its institutions totally overtaken by an armed militia a militia that is involved, actively involved in all the conflicts in the region, you know, in next door Syria, in Palestine, in Yemen, in Bahrain, Iraq, and I might have forgotten a couple as well. Um, so this is this is and this killer uh, armed militia is number one uh, is a fundamental uh, militia. So has its own economy, its own hard currency at the time when it is available in the tree but also against a background where historically and particularly now there is a total absence of any form of investment in people uh, investment in, in invest in that um, uh, um, that are sustainable. Um, and Lena, you're, you're breaking up a lot. Maybe turn off the camera and just speak because you you're not. We can't hear you. Okay. Go ahead. I think I think we just lost her. Oh, Can you hear me better? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're back. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, let me let me use this as an example. The the kind of the bad uh, situation of the uh, connectivity infrastructure is <laughs> is actually one one of the results of bad management of resources, of corruption, of the fact that there is no way to there is no way to do any traceability of where do res the resources come in, where do they flow, and where do they end up uh, end up with. So, an incredibly good good example of corruption. And also, you know, um, uh, um, a country where, um, to be very, to be very uh, um, uh, candid about it, where religious institutions rule in one way or the other, and religious institutions, no matter what they are, and in this uh, uh, context, there are seventeen of them, are actually they are as neoliberal as they come. Uh, the whole spiel and narrative about charity uh, is ridiculous. Uh, these are institutions that do not pay taxes, uh, that are totally out of any form of public scrutiny, uh, and that 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 have diverse way of uh, bringing in income. Uh, on uh, October 17th, and of course, this wasn't the first one that the that the people, you know, had enough. Uh, there was um, a wave of uh, uh, public dissent uh, three or four years ago. But let me let me just explore the October uh, Revolution and why and in, in which ways uh, is it uh, is it different. Um, also, as Radhika mentioned, there was an issue of um, um, seemingly a minor, minor issue of the government wanting to impose taxes on the WhatsApp service, which is normally free service, 
uh, and that was that was it. That was the point of no return, um, because it came against a background of uh, corruption, against misuse of public uh, of public resources, and also against a background of uh, total disagreement with the ways in which the country was misgoverned, mismanaged, and the uh, um, uh, and the co-optation of all the institutions by the uh, army armed, armed militia. Why was it different? Why was this time uh, different? Um, and I can safely say that this was the, the first time where there was a um, 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 an epiphany, kind of an awakening about the different levels of um, uh, imp uh, oppression and injustice that was that were taking place, and that the economy is what it is because it's a product. It's a product of endemic corruption. It's a product of endemic uh, takeover by religious institutions. And it's a product of an endemic uh, um, inefficiency uh, and a, a public sector that has served as, um, as a space for favors and that has served as a space to um, as a space for the powers that be to actually do their businesses and do their deeds. Oh. This was not also this um, this analysis again is not new. In 2015, as I said, there was a major, uh, massive uh, 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 descent in the form of uh, uh, public public demonstrations, etc. Again, vis again started by um, um, by a major scandal, which was basically the regime did not know what to do with its rubbish. Um, and, and it was left out there with absolutely no, with total disregard to the consequences. Okay, but I'm just going to give you one example, which I think was different in the two, uh, in the two um, revolutions of 2015, the uprising of 2015 and then 2019. Um, one, one incident took place in 2015, um, which was uh, the participation of two trans women, I think, uh, in a demonstration in front of the so-called Ministry of Environment. And these uh, trans folks were actually beaten and kicked out of, uh, uh, of the demonstration by the other uh, demonstrators. Go back, to, go to 20, 2019, four years later, Actually, the queer community was part, was was at the front line of the uh, of the of the uprising, with a, a, a particular different narrative. The fact that we are the revolution, that the revolution is not uh, is not about uh, reproducing a different patriarchal system, but actually the revolution, the uprising, is about the reg the recognition of all the diversity of people and people will not be kicked out of a revolution. The second thing was the coming out, if I may say, of all the groups who were, who still are actually, historically uh, oppressed by the economic system, historically oppressed by law and historically oppressed by, uh, by, by, by pra pra you know, daily uh, practices. Migrant women workers, uh, uh, again, an endemic uh, situation of injustice and of violence, not just in Lebanon, but in the whole region. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, um, so, so my refugees, again, uh, of course, uh, the issue of refugees was exacerbated by the war, by the uprising in Syria, but it's not again new. We, ha we had first the Palestinian refugees, which was outside the economic system, dispossessed, uh, 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 not, allowed, not allowed to work and left to rot in, in prisons called refugee camps. Now we have again uh, um, uh, something like 1.5 million additional people left to live on their own uh, in in such situations. So the presence, the voices of these uh, of these uh, of these communities, and also the fact that the uh, um, also the fact that feminist issues came out to the forefront, and th there was a very nice. Um, um, very nice connection with Chile uh, with regard to the uh, uh, calling out on rapists and calling out on uh, uh, on sexual harassers uh, and calling out on harassment which was happening during the demonstrations and actually basically um, um, understanding or maturing enough to say well these issues are part of the uprising part of what we're calling for if a sexual harasser is a comrade who uh, agrees with us 
on the economic demands that we're putting out there, he's still a sexual harasser and he's still part of the patriarchal system. And I think that uh, narrative was also very strong in, uh, um, in, uh, in, the, in the revolution. Um, Radhika, how long do I, do I still have? I can't hear you. Yeah, you. Sorry, you have about five more minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, what is it? What were the lessons that were drawn? I mean, of course, it's um, um, uh, it's not it's not surprising. But uh, what was uh, uh, what was the takeaways from? Uh, um, I would say, I mean, maybe we can call it an aborted uprising because definitely. Uh, COVID uh, put a stop to, to the dynamic. And of course, as we know, in many in many totalitarian regimes, uh, the regimes will use anything to abort any social movement. And COVID came as a gift. Uh, the first thing that the regime did uh, at, uh, during COVID was actually to go and take down all the tents of uh, the people who were demonstrating under the guise that this was for uh, to protect people's health. So yes, it was aborted, but let me just pull out some of the main takeaways. Um, first of all, it is it was very clear that um, the assumptions, uh, all the assumptions that uh, shape, uh, influence, and inform our economic policies are patriarchal assumptions in a sense that they are based on an idea of the heteronormative family that has a head of household. This head of household is a male, and basically he decides uh, everything. Where does this come uh, come 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 into play? Well, when the when the when the government decides on any so-called uh, social protection uh, uh, policy, this is on the basis of, of of families that are heteronormative with an agreed uh, uh, head of male head of household. The second is that truly, and this was obvious because of COVID, um, the regime continues to ignore uh, care work continues to ignore it in terms of recognizing it, recognizing it as A, essential, B, being born by a particular uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, of, of people, be it citizens or residents, and I mean here the migrant, migrant domestic, domestic work, workers. And while at the same time, our regimes continue to glorify, they have a narrative that glorify care work, but, but definitely, uh, but it stops here. It doesn't go into, uh, uh, policies that recognize care work or any form of interventions that would um, change the distribution of uh, uh, of care work. Um, and of course, you know, um, what was really obvious was the ways in which the um, religious institutions and the religious militias and the regime were actually in cahoots in terms of making sure that the different forms of social dissent are um, thwarted one way uh, or the other, but also that the narrative and the status quo remain uh, remain uh, remain the same. What, and 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 in 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 um, uh, reproducing the narrative that um, women's care work, women's free labor is essential, but shall not be shall not be uh, uh, um, shall not be recognized in any in other, in any other way. Um, and perhaps the last thing, and this was particularly obvious after uh, the Beirut blast, which happened on August 4th, 2020, and which was, as you probably know, the third biggest explosion, non-nuclear uh, uh, explosion in the history of the globe, and which destroyed a large part of the, of the, of the city, and it destroyed a large part of the economy, uh, and also had a, a specific impact on uh, uh, on the queer community, on sex workers, on migrant workers, on refugees, which remains, I mean, there's 10 months later, there is absolutely no justice done towards it, also exacerbated the fact of, or the understanding that whatever it is that we have, whatever social contract that we have now uh, is useless. And that unless, unless a new social contract is thought collectively that is inclusive, um, then the situation is likely to, uh, to remain the same. And I want to conclude by um, what is irreversible in what happened? Uh, yes, of course, it's an aborted uh, uh, uprising. Yes, of course, the powers that be 
are still there. And of course they are armed and they have all the resources. Yes, we have witnessed during the past year, just to give you an example, um, we, our dollar was, uh, um, um, uh, was equivalent to 1,500 Lebanese pounds. Our dollar today has exceeded 15,000 Lebanese pounds, just to give you the magnitude of, uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the problem. But what is irreversible is the fact that um, dissent and anger have increased, and dissent and anger uh, are totally irreversible, especially when you see a regime that continues uh, with its oppression, that continues with its patriarchal practices. Um, feminist organizing has proved to be the most intelligent in analyzing uh, uh, this, the system, in linking the confessional system uh, the patriarchal system with uh, whatever economy that we have that I, I, I doubt anybody can describe it uh, now. Uh, anger vis-a-vis -vis the confessional power and the, one, the will uh, to dismantle confessional power, by confessional I mean religious, is actually, it's, it's actually difficult to take away now. It's in the psyche, in the mind, in the lived experience of every, of every person. But I want to circle back, and maybe that's my last, uh, my last point. Um, um, circling back to what Paris was saying, I think the most important, irreversible, powerful thing that has happened is that those who are invisible are now visible. Uh, has their life changed? Uh, do they have more, better entitlement, more entitlement? Probably not, and probably not in the near future. But invisibility is no longer uh, there. Uh, voices um, voices are, 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 are heard and are loud, and people are no longer, women are no longer invisible, migrant workers are no longer invisible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, 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 I think I want to stop here, and thank you, Radhika. Um, for having me on this panel. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited that you were able to do it. So last and definitely not the least, Sagari, you want to take it off? Thank you, Radhika. And thank you, Magdalena, Lina, and Paris for giving me the energy. Um, so much resonated, the sites of oppression and the resistance and the way we as feminists resist. Um, we here in India are just emerging from one of the worst um, second wave pandemic. And of course, the kind of massacre that has ensued, we hold our government accountable completely for what has occurred because they did not heed anybody's advice, neither citizen nor scientist. And they went ahead organizing religious gatherings, political rallies, elections, just to accrue more power. And of course, with that, they spread the, ensure that we had the second wave pandemic. And of course, parallelly, what they have done beginning from the last year, has been enacting the worst kinds of anti-people legislations, backed up with also negotiating all kinds of global trade deals, and then of course, arresting human rights defenders and putting into jail and incarcerating anybody who dares to question or dares to raise their voices. Because at the end of the day, what we see is a complete threat to the fabric of democracy, and our constitution in this country, which is really being built on the pillars of liberty, equality, fraternity, our written by one of the most amazing people in our history, Dr. V.R. Ambedkar. He was a person who came from one of the most oppressed communities in this system or structure of caste, which was created by the powerful or the Brahminism as we put it. And of course, that is the only thing which remains between us and a form of saffron fascism which faces us. And therefore, we continue to resist. We continue to resist. And the resistance, which has been completely amazing in this past year, has been the resistance of women in the farmers' movement. We've had a long history of agrarian um, movements, but Surely, historically, this is the first time that here in India, we have seen women out in their thousands, um, literally saying that, you know, this is our life and we shall protest. And of course, the protests that we have seen in the last eight months um, have been largely women in, from Punjab, from Haryana. These are in the northern part of India. And why have they been protesting? 
What has been the reason why so many thousands of women have been out there on the streets, camping, protesting, facing the brutality of police repression, a completely immobile state refusing to actually listen to why are these women out there protesting. And to move forward, this, the immediate trigger has been the legislation of three farm laws, which in a nutshell results in a complete deregulation of India's still thus far regulated agriculture and food markets. And of course, as women say, this is going to be the final kind of dispossession because undoubtedly we've had a whole lot of neoliberal reforms which have been carried through, but thus far there has been this protection by a regulated sense of the market. And when we, just to break it down further, when you look at the global systems and the food systems and the supply chains, what they really don't want are these billions of small and marginal farmers who are right now, that is the, the most important base of farming in India. And what they want to do is aggregate them into farmer producer organizations because it becomes easier then to aggregate commodities and produce and then link them up to agribusiness logistic companies and thereby get rid of the whole millions of people in, in the informal sector, small traders, wholesalers, agents, who today are really doing the whole role of procurement and distribution of food. Because in this global supply chain, it is about right now filling in the gaps and plugging it in with wherever there is a, any form of informality in their words, and then to formalize it. And that's precisely what these farm laws are doing. So to come back to the resistance, and I'm not from Punjab, I'm from the southern part of India, I belong to an alliance called the Food Sovereignty Alliance. For movements like us, we have been completely inspired by the uprising, by this kind of resistance, which women coming out on the roads in the Punjab and Haryana and their resistance to this farm laws. And it's been completely inspirational for us. We are a movement comprised of indigenous Adibasi, Dalit in the structure of caste. The Dalit are communities who've been historically oppressed. Bahujan, again, a community of diverse oppressed commu communities in the system of caste. Muslim, landless agriculture workers, small marginal farmers, pastoralists, and citizens who are non-farm producing or non-farming citizens, but organizing around the issue of food justice and food sovereignty. And we must say here that the kind of resistance you have seen, we have seen in India, has been uneven across India, particularly in terms of the participation or the leadership of women. And here we have to see that for the first time, these are not foot soldiers. These are women who are leaders, who are conceptualizers, who are intellectually thinking of the next strategy. And so here in South India, in Telangana, where I am, if there have been hundreds out in the street, in the Punjab and Haryana, you've seen tens and thousands of women out in the street. But for our movement, it has been an opportunity to also reflect on what exactly is the difference? How exactly has capitalism captured the markets, captured agriculture and food and farming? And how exactly has this imp the implications of that in our own realities? So for instance, and this has, this kind of analysis has also deepened our own organizing strategies as to where we are. And so what I'm gonna try and do is actually bring out these nuances and also bring out how the primary organizing against the kind of distress in farming is happening also in different ways. So to come back to the Punjab and Haryana, the situation and the kind of protest we see there, you know, agriculture in India is a state-informed subject. So states can decide what kind of policies they want to pursue. And one of the things, despite all the kind of economic liberalism and, and the enter, entry of capital that we have seen, but in the Punjab, the centrality of protecting what is known as the mandi or the central market yard, which is a state-regulated space where the majority, in fact, 100% of wheat and paddy, which are the two main crops, are procured at the site of the mandi or the, or the market. And of course, the government has announced, keeps announcing assured minimum support prices or prices through which they procure the wheat and paddy. And then this goes finally into our public distribution system. 
And the three laws essentially, one of the major things they do is to undermine the system. And one of the things which brings together, and if we look at the Punjab situation, in fact, the kind of internal contradictions which many people have pointed to, you have today Dalit, landless agriculture workers who themselves are organized through their own unions fighting for the control of land who have aligned today in this movement with small marginal farmer unions and larger farmer unions why because they all have this shared interest of actually disallowing the government from dismantling this most important site of the market which today really is the protection that they get and in place what what stares us in our face is an utterly privatized market controlled by capital, controlled by big agribusiness, right from farm to fork. And today the two big names which are there and in this protest against capitalism is Adani and Ambani. These are the two big major kind of corporate players who stand to gain with this kind of the new laws which are coming with a deregulated market. They're in the business of ports, in the business of logistics, in the build business of coal chains, in the business of setting up E-Trade and the E-Trade business and the retail markets and all of these together. And this is why the kind of protest we see is a very clear anti-capitalist protest. And in fact, finally, even the small little stores that we have in this country known as Kirana stores have also today been captured by the arms of whether it is Ambani and Reliance or the Amazons and the Walmarts, because they want to just make this part of the chain of this farm to fork and no longer allow the freedom or the independence of small little players, of small little who are providing the food to in our food system today. But when it comes to my state in Telangana, and I'm going to have to try and bring very quickly to you a history of the last 30 years, the history of neoliberal reforms in agriculture and food farming and what is this meant for our, those of us who've lived this 30 year history. And of course, there's much to be said about food imperialism prior to that, but we don't have time. The history of green revolution technologies and all of that leading up to the economic reforms that we have seen. Now in my state of Telangana, which at that time was the United State of Andhra Pradesh, and the period of the 90s or the pre-economic liberalization was a period of total revolution and ferment. Women along with men organizing for land was one of the big movements because we continue to be a state of high inequality of land ownership and women specifically organizing against liquor because they had identified liquor as being one of the reasons why they were experiencing violence is also the fact that that's where income was getting lost, not coming from a moralistic position of liquor. And they in fact enforced a complete ban on liquor through this movement. But then of course, India succumbed to international monetary fund pressures, empire, economic reforms and structural adjustment, and of course, unleashed police and economic repression to crush these movements. And over and over again, through these last 30 years, it's been about crushing movements economically and using the might of the state in the form of the police. Our state was also one of the, I think it was probably a design of the World Bank and the state to actually have an independent, it was the first state to have an independent multi sectoral set of credit agreements and loan agreements with the World Bank. And the World Bank really has fast tracked neoliberalism. And in fact, our state has been like a guinea pig. You try out all your institutional models, you see what works, you see what doesn't work. And then finally you magnify it in nationally to the other states. And therefore the kind of repression and the kind of neoliberal reforms and the kind of uh, models that we see and institutions that have been built is really, we can really see that that's how it's played out in, in the state where I live, Telangana and in Andhra Pradesh. So what did the World Bank come in and say? Of course, its recommendations and its conditionalities for the loans included a whole lot of reforms in agriculture, reducing 70% of the populations whose work, life and depends on agriculture to 35%, withdrawal of subsidies, privatization of all inputs, power, seeds, upkeep of water bodies, extension and knowledge, slashing state budgets, agriculture credit, deregulation of markets, which actually, which today is happening nationally, but has happened steadily in the state I live in over the last 30 years. They actually 
recommended removal of reservations to all kinds of small scale industries and food processors, because we know today that some of the largest players in the agri business are food processing agri business. And of course, when it came to our public distribution of food, they forced us to change our public distribution from what was a universal system, everybody had access to food, which was distributed to a targeted one. And this was accompanied by privatization of education, health, and unbelievably, they actually recommended to the government to lift on the liquor ban because why? A quarter of the state's tax revenues was coming from liquor. And this is exactly what happened. Parallel to this, and very critically in our experience and our history, was forcing women to aggregate their small little savings as self-help groups and building this model as an institutional structure from villages to districts to state. And all this, millions of millions of women, their savings then became this kind of a platform or a foundation of capital, which then had to be linked to banks. Banks then can you, you were, have been able to utilize this as a conduit to sell all their financial services, to sell their loans and benefit out of this. And what has been the results after 30 years? Complete killing fields. We are one of the states with the highest level rates of farmer suicides, completely out of distress. We're the state with one of the highest levels of indebtedness. 90% of our farmers are indebted, while if you look at other, the average in India, it's about 50%. And of course, in all of this, finally, today, when there is a international now, there's a global interest once again in agroecology. There's a consumers who's interested in organic. There's an interest in the climate crisis. So what do we have? But agribusiness and state and bank once again coming together to capture what we as movements always thought was our way of taking back control, capturing agroecology. So we have this bizarre situation today where the, where the state has got banks like BNP Paribas. So of course, we know who has the most terrible kind of history of financing the worst kind of coal mining across the world, who is giving out loans for Indian farmers to, trans, to, to, to transform their farming from chemical to non-chemical. And of course, all of this is going to be done through this structure, which you have built up of the SHG groups or the women's groups, so that you can conduit and pass your in loans via those groups, who in turn, and then of course the state, be able to completely wash its hands off from having to do anything to do with farming and farmers. And ironically, the name of this, the name of this program is designated as zero budget. But what has this meant for those of for us in our state of Andhra Pradesh? Of course, there is so much which has been written and spoken about the feminization of labor, which has, in, which has occurred in these last 30 years, about the fact that 80% of labor towards producing food in India is women. But we in the Alliance and our analysis and our organizing to, is very clearly indicating the fact that small marginal farmers, Dalit, Bahujan, landless workers, and the bulk of small marginal farmers, which form the base of India's farming and our state's farming, 80%, it is women's labor, which is holding up. And this exploited labor, this, val this invisible labor, which is really growing the profits of the agribusiness. It is labor in the form of family labor. It is labor in the form of exchange of labor. It is labor in the form of small marginal farmers having to hire each one in only to be producing an alienated produce or a commodity which you have no control over. You are the recipients. You are enslaved by, the, by seeds, by fertilizers, by pesticides, by herbicides, by tractors, machines which are coming in. And it is women's invisible labor which is growing their profits. So the thing is, unplug that labor as a strategy. The second is that when you look at the deregulated markets, and this is extremely important to understand, why is it that, say, in our state, the kind of women, the kind of response that we see of women coming out on the streets protesting the farm laws that we see in Punjab has not really been that evident in, say, the states, in many other states, is that the deregulation process of markets ensued over the years. So for instance, even if I take the case of paddy, that is rice, right? Rice today, in the name of decentralization, what the state has done is actually given the responsibility to the SHG group, to the self-help group of women, you procure the rice. 
to the cooperatives, the primary agriculture cooperative societies, you procure the rice. To rice mills, you procure the rice. So there is an invisibility of the state. So when something like the farm laws come in or when they, they, they threaten that there will be no longer any minimum support price, which is one of the demands of the farmers' movements today, that you guarantee us a minimum support price in our, in your, in your, in your, as an act. It is very difficult because you can't pin down where the state is. Visibly for you, it is your own women. And this has been so cleverly designed because if there is a problem you face, you approach your own group of women who've been doing the procuring of your rice and therefore letting the state off the hook. And therefore today, when you have this whole conglomerate of agribusiness now who's gonna take over your markets completely, including the cold chains, including the storage, you obviously have a situation where women are struggling to identify where exactly is your enemy. And therefore, our organizing tells us that we have to do this kind, we continue to do this kind of deconstruction so women can understand, oh, ho, so this is where exactly too we are getting exploited. Coupled with this is the fact that when you created over 30 years, in a financial capital system, a system where women have been completely used and exploited, not only through the fact that they become conduits of your loans, but that you have used this system to police one another. So the banks don't have to do anything to recover their loan. They have a whole structure of women who've been structured in the name of so-called women's empowerment, structured to actually police one another to get back that loan. And women today in our movements who are who have been forced, forced because they are linked, the state has linked their presence or absence in a self-help group to various entitlements. They say that, you know, our minds, you work all day in the fields, you come back and when you have a women's group, all your minds are occupied with this, which woman has not repaid their debt? How do we police that woman? How do we get our next debt to repay another debt? So the design has been very clear. So you can capture, one more minute. Yeah, sorry. You okay. capture women, if you can capture women and you enslave them financially. And here we see how in Andhra Pradesh, you've had so many World Bank projects. In the case of Punjab, very few World Bank projects. Similarly, self-help groups, we have nearly 1.1 million in my, in, across the two states where we are. But in Punjab, they're very few. You really see how women's financial enslavement can crush their resistance. But we in the movement, we are organizing to dismantle the capitalist Brahminic patriarchal food farming regime. We begin with popular education, the business of the, 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 the fact that you have to continue to conscientize, to identify your enemy, and then analyze and collectively organize your actions. Our actions include very clearly organizing for land and resources, organizing for food, we're very, very critical to this is getting back control of our resources, beginning with the collectivizing of labor, collectivizing of labor, collectivizing of seeds, collectivizing of knowledge, because all of this enable you to liberate one from the agribusiness conglomerate, which has already enslaved you. And two, it is only through your collectivization of labor that you can actually challenge this collectivization and enslavement of the finance capital system, which today has been, is, is crushing women's resistance with that. And I end there by saying that if the Punjab women are out there demonstrating on the streets, the women in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh and several other parts of India, but I speak of our movement, are organizing and resisting in different diverse ways, but of course building and having the strategic alliances because these continue to be so important. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, what an inspirational four speakers we just had. I'm, I'm ready to go jump out on the streets um, and start working. Um, can, can you remove the, yeah, the slide just, so that- Yeah, yeah, I'm just doing that. Thank you so much. One second. Oh, I'm getting some... Okay, yeah. Perfect. Okay, wow, I'm inspired. I don't know about you. I hope you're all inspired. <laughs> um, so we have a little bit of time uh, for some um, questions, comments uh, to the speakers. I'll give the speakers a chance at the end to sort of 
I mean, to me, I think there's so many connections between each of the talks and, and about strategies and resistance and how we move forward. Uh, but I want to give uh, folks that are here a chance to uh, speak. I, I can't see everybody. So maybe uh, you could just put it in a chat or I'll just keep going back and forth. Also, Radhika, if they raise their hands, use the hand raising tool, then that anyone with their hand raised will come to the uh, top of the queue and Perfect. you'll be able to see them. Perfect. So please raise your hand. It's under reactions at the bottom. There's a thing that says you can raise your hand. So thanks. Thanks, Andrea. That was good. Um, so please raise your hand. Okay, no one's raising their hand. Uh, maybe I'll give you a, a minute, but you know what? Why don't, since since no one's jumping in, I think we're all sort of so inspired by these, these talks that we need to digest it for a minute. Uh, so why don't I, I go back and just sort of have the speakers talk about the ways in which each of the movements in all these three countries really resonate uh, to me in so many ways in terms of, you know, uh, an issue of economic systems and how the organizing is about sort of neoliberal capitalist uh, uh, economics uh, in terms of reproductive health, in terms of transgender movements, in terms of so many things resonated uh, across uh, each of the presentations. Uh, so why don't I give, uh, I'll start, I don't know, I don't know where I'll start. I'll start with Magdalena. And if you could just say, given the, the kind of um, inspiration, uh, and then I'll go to Paris and uh, Lena, and just a couple of minutes about any kind of connections you see between the different movements across the, the world. Well, I, I, I think that one, one key issue here is about the unequal distribution of care and domestic work and how this impact women uh, excessively. Uh, in, in, in that sense, I mean, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the situation. I mean, with women uh, needed to, uh, to uh, school children at home, uh, but also taking care of all, I mean, with the, with the health system closing down to other diseases, many people without COVID, but uh, with in illness ended up being taken care of at home. So I think that uh, this really was a, a, a pivotal moment for uh, women's resistance and feminist movements, uh, especially I would say in, in Chile, because it's, uh, it, it was, I mean, we had the social unrest, and then everything was exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, and, and then it was, it was a matter of this is the moment in which things have to change. And, um, and I think that that was, that was critical. And I think that that was also an important push for uh, putting the issue of uh, care and domestic work at the center of the discussion. We have been following up the, the, with, with colleagues uh, that are, are based in Chile. We as an organization, we're working in, in Chile, uh, working with partners to, to, to try to influence the constitutional process. And what we have been following is that I can tell you that in last October uh, or November, after everything started, um, care and domestic work wasn't a key fundamental issue. Uh, and now it is. I mean, now most of the organization and the, the local organization and the movement, the feminist movements that we work with have put this as a major issue on the agenda. So we don't know how it's going to uh, be included at the end. The constitution required a two third majority adoption. It is very high uh, and um, so we, we don't know, but, uh, and then, after it's adopted, there is going to be another referendum. Uh, so the citizens will need to actually uh, approve again uh, the, the, the outcome of the process. So we don't know, 
but what we expect at this moment that uh, in few months uh, or for since October 2019 to now, the issue is now key in the agenda and it was never before. So for me, that is it's very inspiring. That's fantastic. Um, Paris, did you wanna jump in for a couple of minutes? I think um, what comes to mind for me and thanks everyone for sharing their this important work is the, yes, that we are all talking about making the invisible visible and how important that is. And I also think there's something really important around the rise of religious fundamentalisms, as well as these fascist governments at the same time that have created these conditions, as well as a, as a pandemic that have created these pandemic, these conditions for social movements that have been unlike any other time. Um, and, and at the same time in the US, just to, you know, this year we've dealt with, there've been, I think someone said like over 150 anti-trans laws that have been enacted on the state level. Like they have, um, they have been an increase of abortion restrictions. The Supreme Court in the US is set up in a way that there's actually, I mean, access to abortion has not, it's been a post role reality anyway, but there actually is, the people are in place to actually, you know, dismantle abortion access even more. So we're seeing um, these interesting moves that are happening that by the opposition that we must be really mindful of. And I really appreciated the, the last presenter really talking about what happens is that these systems get created that then people end up policing the people that they're supposed to be doing empowerment work for. So we must be really mindful when we cannot give into false solutions. Um, we must be mindful of our, our most liberatory and radical visions around the policies and behavior and culture change that we, that we demand because otherwise um, we, could, we could very well be involved in our own um, undoing. Thank you. Uh, Lena? I think you're muted. Okay, so I wanted to make a comment, an additional comment related to the MENA region, not just Lebanon. Uh, and let's just look back at the last 10 years and what happened as a result of the revolutions in general, which were triggered by economic uh, uh, dissent and by the fact that more and more people uh, were becoming poor. And let's remember that as a result, uh, Islamist regimes came into power and Islamist regimes marketed themselves as being the savior of the economy, as being pro-poor, as being, you know, they, they lobbied basically uh, uh, amongst the poor. They were speaking for, for, for the poor. Let's just pause and look at what, what they did. Wealth distribution, redistribution was never on their, uh, on their agenda. Uh, they proceeded as fastly and even faster than others in lifting subsidies on basic goods. They went on with the process of eroding workers' rights even faster than any, than any other. Uh, they glorified care work and at the same time, uh, uh, they used it as a, as, um, as a way to, get to, to keep women at home. I, I just want to remind us of uh, the first Islamist uh, prime minister uh, in Morocco uh, a few years back, who simply said in an official uh, uh, in an official speech, he said the reason why we have unemployment is because women are working. When women go back home, there will be they will liberate jobs for men, and also they will bring back harmony within the family. They called them the light. He called them the light of the family. Um, control over women's bodies became, you know, uh, unf unfettered. You know, anti-abortion. Uh, anti anti uh, anti women's rights uh, uh, no investment in sexual and reproductive health and right and also let us remember um, let us remember the um, a queer activist from uh, from Egypt uh, Sarah Higazi who was basically imprisoned tortured sexually abused for raising the pride flag simply that this is what this was what she what she did and she ended up taking her life away after the series of, of abuse you know, to which she, she was subjected simply because she raised the, 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 pride, the, the, the pride flag. So what does, this, what does this tell us is that 
all of these uh, kind of, uh, because they present themselves as opposition to neoliberal economists, they are actually worst. Um, and any kind of social, uh, uh, social movements that do not have a very clear intersectional, fem uh, feminist intersectional discourse and demands and that are not inclusive are basically uh, uh, simply a repeat of what we've been uh, uh, witnessing for the last for the few decades. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, Paris, I just saw your message. You you have she has to jump off. So do you want to just add something to to end, and we'll continue with Sagari after that. So that yes, I'm so sorry. I have a con. I just, it's actually it's a big. I'm already late to it, but I have to really get to this meeting. Um, I just have really been so inspired by what folks have um have have um have just stated, and I you know it, the time is now. We really are in need for transnational feminist movement, you know, and so I'm really excited about thinking about how do we really come together to be building together um, and really building together. Yes, like no false solidarity. Right. So real solidarity, as well as how do we really take aim really at these systems that are that are built with our destruction in mind. So really deep appreciation. I'll drop my um, web, my email in the website to get in, to be able to be in touch. But I, I do apologize that I have to run. Thank you so much for joining us. Sagar, you want to have a couple minutes? Yeah. Um, thank you, Radhika. And I think what really struck me was one, of course, capitalism and the way it has just you know, really literally destroyed and continues to destroy. And I think it's capitalism and neoliberal, when we talk about neoliberal forces, it is really just the advance of capitalism. And that's what completely uh -huh. struck me. And, and the way in which then feminist organizing um, and looking at all the intersectionalities is utterly important. I mean, this come, came through for me in all the, you know, from from Chile to Lebanon to, 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 to um, Paris's uh, sharing, and of course here in India. I think the other thing which really struck me was here where, whether it's in Chile or Lebanon and you're, you know, there's, there's a struggle for actually rewriting your constitution to, 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 to write a constitution which is really reflective of justice, of feminist um, politics. Here in India, the, the, what really then struck me and got me thinking is we had one of the most feminist, um, you know, I would say Ambedkar was one of the first feminists that we've ever had here in this country, who was the key, who, who just poured in. I mean, if we have a constitution today, the way we have, and today this is at stake, right? So we have a constitution, despite that constitution, we have neoliberal reforms which came in. We have this whole history of 30 years. We have a history of oppression. Therefore, I think one needs to also, I mean, drawing from the experience in India, I think a constitution is extremely important. But along with the constitution today, what we see or what we have seen is that the institutions which are making sure that that constitution works, right? So therefore, in, in a democracy, um, in a democracy where we have, where you have this ability, you have, it's supposed to really mean that the democracy allows for the constitution to work. But on the other hand, what we see is we have the constitution and at every step of the way, then the state starts appropriating more and more power um, to then undermine the constitution. So I think that that's what an element that we need to constantly be dealing with. The, the fact that a constitution is extremely important but then when we look at an economic framework or a social framework or, or questions of structures, of macro structures, in the case of India, if you take of take Brahminism, right? Um, so it, it is about then that kind of, of, of citizen liberation and awareness and organizing, which I think which really comes through extremely uh, powerfully, which I could take back from all the presentations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, there, there's a few comments on the chat on on working with uh, climate change and other issues with the feminist movement. We're we're sadly running out of time, uh, and we still have a few other things to take care of. As this is the closing plenary, and uh, 
and, and kind of the close of, of the conference. So uh, what I would suggest is, um, you know, the, the, the platform that we've been using has a chat function where people can go and sort of have more conversations about this, because I, I just have a feeling if we start with climate change and the feminist movement, it'll be here for another hour and we only have about 10 minutes. So uh, I think it's a really important question. And I want to really thank the four amazing, amazing presentations. Uh, I know I'm the one who uh, found all of you and, and it's, it's uh, not a coincidence that there's a link between <laughs> the kind of anti-capitalist uh, rhetoric of all of them. This is why I, I pulled this together. I, I really, uh, I thought it would be great. I didn't know how great this panel would be. And, and I, I agree that I think this is really a moment for um, a transnational feminist movements that are based ground up you know, not, not sort of the INGO feminist movements who go to the UN, which I'm a part of, but, um, but really how do we, we share these solidarities and, and, and offer ways in which we can connect and, and do work together and support each other. Uh, and so I think that's something for us to think about as IAFI to see if there's, there's a platform and how we can use this to really support the work that so many of you are doing on the ground that are feminist and economic in, in your, your struggles and how we can be a part of that movement uh, as, as IAFI. Uh, so I'm going to now uh, ask uh, Andrea or Jihee to upload um, a slide. Uh, so this is sort of the institutional sponsors of uh, IAFI's conference. So uh, UN Women, Flasco, Ecuador, Pontificia Universidad Católico de Ecuador, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Banco Central de uh, Ecuador, uh, Universidad Central de Ecuador, Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar of Ecuador, and the Friedrich Ebert Stifling Foundation. Uh, do we have another slide? Just this one. Oh, uh, we also want to thank the, I, I'm not sure why this is in here, but the Hewlett Foundation uh, that really helped uh, in providing so many people access to this, this conference uh, in terms of subsidizing free registration for people from around the world so that so many people were able to join. I want to also thank the Zoom host staff that did an incredible job. This is our first um, you know, virtual conference. So the fact that it came off so well is, is uh, amazing. And then the conference assistant, Katie McNamara, who kind of organized all the student help in each of the sessions. I, uh, incredible job. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and the interpreters, Abra Palabra, what an amazing job you've done. It was seamless. The technology was great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the Quito Local Committee, I don't have all the names of everyone. I think uh, Cheryl uh, read them all in the, in the opening. Uh, and the Quito sponsors. Uh, and, and, and I want to thank Carmen Diana Deer and Cheryl us who really pulled this amazing conference together. Uh, you know, our first virtual conference, it was incredible. What an amazing uh, conversation we've had for the last uh, two days. And, and last, but certainly not the least, is uh, Jihee Jolly and Andrea Collins, who are our staff at IAFI, who really have been working nonstop for forever and definitely need a, a vacation uh, <laughs> very soon to go and rest. Uh, I want to thank them for doing all this incredible work. And um, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Andrea, did I forget anyone? Carmen, Cheryl, is there anyone that, that I need to, to talk about? We're good. Okay, thank you all. And uh, uh, Cheryl, you're there. 
Okay. Uh, and I want to, and also we, you know, because we're not in person. In, if we were in person, we would be giving Cheryl a gift as being the outgoing president and organizing all this. So here's a virtual gift. I don't know what it is, but uh, thank you for for pulling this together with Carmen. And and you know, it's been a a very complicated year, um, and you know, we didn't know where we're going to be, what we're going to do. So the fact that we did right. this and you did you did all this work has been amazing so i want to personally thank you as the now outgoing president um to thank you for all the stuff that you've done over the year um so i will end it there uh unless andrea or Jihi have to tell me that i need to do something else uh just i just want to make sure people know there is one more set of concurrent sessions that starts at 12 30. just a reminder right right Thank you so much, and uh, Thank you. we'll be at seeing you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. No. Thanks so much, Radhika. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Radhika. Bye. Bye. Terrific job, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you.